congratulations, you've made it to the fifth and final week of the conformal field theory part of this module. This week, uh, we have our payoff. We're going to talk about the uh, conformal bootstrap. This is a way of constraining the space of conformal field theories. Now, to show you what the conformal bootstrap is, I first have to introduce the concept of crossing symmetry. What the conformal bootstrap is, in a sentence or less, is the application of crossing symmetry uh, to constrain the space of conformal field theories. So let's begin. Let's tell you what crossing symmetry is. So last week uh, we ended our discussion uh, with a way of defining conformal field theory. A definition of a conformal field theory, what is it? It's a collection of conformal primary operators, phi i, along with their three-point functions, or more specifically the constants in those three-point functions, which is the only degree of freedom that the three-point functions are left, left with after you apply the constraint of conformal symmetry. Okay, so given this set of conformal primaries and the associated three-point functions, you can ask a question. Would any such collection work? If you give me your favorite set of uh, three-point function coefficients along with the dimensions and representations of the Lorentz algebra for all the conformal primaries, could I go and, and define some kind of consistent conformal field theory uh, from that data? And the answer to that question is no. Uh, and the reason is that if you go and look at higher point functions, you're gonna find certain inconsistencies. Now, what are these inconsistencies? These inconsistencies they're uh, inconsistencies with crossing symmetry. It's the failure of crossing symmetry. So I have to tell you now how this works. So let's go to the next page so I have some more space. I have a fresh page to start with and we'll forge ahead. So for simplicity, let's consider a four point function of four scalar operators, four identical scalar primaries, phi of x1, phi of x2, phi of x3, phi of x4, inserted at four separate points. And uh, because I'm, I want to reserve the capital Greek letter delta for something else, the, the, sum, the sums over the conformal blocks, let's, let's let the, the scaling weight of, of, uh, of phi be eta. All right, so if I have this four point function, we saw last time, we saw last time that this guy let's call it i, we could write i as a function of two cross ratios, g of u and v, uh, divided by uh, a prefactor um, which is forced on us by conformal symmetry. So the difference between points one and two raised to the two eta power, the difference between points three and four raised to the two eta power. And that's all we could tell based on the constraints of, of conformal symmetry alone, at least as we applied it uh, way back in, in, in chapter three. Now, what we did next uh, last week is we, we performed this conformal block decomposition. We, we decomposed this function g into a sum over conformal blocks or a sum over conformal primaries and their descendants. So we took x1 close to x2, we took x3 close to x4, and uh, we replaced, you know, phi of x1, phi of x2 by its uh, operator product expansion, having brought those two operators close together. We replaced phi of x3, phi of x4 with their operator product expansion, having taken x3 and x4 close together. And then we multiplied those two operator product expansions together, and we found this sum over conformal primaries that are exchanged uh, between the two pairs of operators. So that's what we did last week. And there's a very natural question you could ask. You could say, well, we don't have to bring x1 close to x2. What if we brought it close to some other point? What if instead we took x1 close to x4 and uh, x3 close to x2? We should get the same answer, right? It, it, the physics shouldn't depend. The scattering should be the same whether we take, whether we decompose it uh, one way or the other. So this is the basic concept of crossing symmetry. So let, let's see what, see what this means in the context of these functions and conformal blocks. So we see immediately, right, that when we do this, it's effectively like swapping x2 with x4. At the level of the equations, we've swapped x2 and x4. And so if we look at the, the actual cross ratios, these u, well, that was x1, 2 squared, x3, 4 squared over x1, 3 squared, x2, 4 squared, and v was the other independent one, x1, 4 squared, x2, 3 squared, divided by x1, 3 squared, x2, 4 squared. Well, we see if we swap 2 and 4, the denominators of these uh, two cross ratios stays the same, but the numerators exchange places. So this swap also swaps u and v, okay? So if we take this other choice for which points to bring close together, we've swapped the two cross ratios. So what does this mean? It means it better mean that this four-point function, which we wrote on the previous page as g of u, v, over this prefactor x1, 2, 
to the 2 eta, x3, 4 to the 2 eta. It had better be the same as g of v and u. Notice I've swapped the arguments of this function because I'm swapping which points I'm taking close to one another. And then I also have to do a swap in the denominator. So I've got, what have I, what have I, what do I have? I've got 1, 4 to the 2 eta and x, um, 3, 2, 3 to the 2 eta. So those had better be equal or this, this uh, conformal field theory is going to be inconsistent. So what I'd like to do now is I'd like to do a little bit of uh, massage of this formula to bring it into a slightly nicer form, a, a, a way that just depends on the cross ratios, and so it's just a, a, a statement about conformal, conformally invariant functions. So this, this equality, if I bring the prefactors to the opposite sides and I divide by the denominators in these cross ratios, it's equivalent to another relation, which is v to the eta, g of u and v. That has to be e, u to the eta, g of v and u. And now finally, let's insert our conformal block expansion. So let's, let's decompose it into a sum of our conformal primaries and their descendants. So we'll insert the conformal blocks and we'll have this uh, a relation we saw in, in the lecture la last week, the last lecture at the end of last week. We find we can write this as v to the eta, a sum over all of the exchanged primaries, c delta i. These are these uh, three-point function coefficients or operator product expansion coefficients. They're the same. And one of these g's for each primary that's exchanged. This had better be equal to u to the eta sum on delta i, c delta i again. It's the same sum, g delta i of v and u. Okay, I'm just re-expressing uh, the overall four-point function in terms of these sums over the uh, intermediate exchanged um, uh, conformal primary. Now, this may all feel a little bit too algebraic, and it's nice to have uh, maybe a more pictorial uh, view of what's going on. So let me, at, at the bottom of this slide, let, let's, let's write a picture for what's going on. We can, we can think about this expression pictorially in the, in the following way. We can think about it as a sum over these exchange primaries, and then I'll write kind of a Feynman diagram. So we have our points one and two, which we've brought close together. They produce a primary, uh, which is exchanged, a primary of dimension delta and Lorentz representation i. And the statement of crossing symmetry is I should be able to write that as a similar sum, but where I instead bring the points uh, 1 and 4 and 2 and 3 close together. So here's 2 and 3, 4 and 1, and my sum over delta i. That's maybe just a, a nicer pictorial way of seeing it which is unencumbered by uh, all this algebra. Okay, I, I want to continue to uh, massage this formula. I, I don't have it in quite the right form that I want it yet for, for the bootstrap. Uh, so let's, let's keep working. Uh, let's copy this and put it on the next page and keep going. Okay, so the next thing I want to do is I want to pull out an operator that I'm always going to find in these in this four-point function of four identical scalars. I want to pull out the identity operator. This is just a factor of one. Uh, I mean, it's it's the fact that when I, you know, I bring uh, two of these scalars together, I can just compute a two-point function uh, for that scalar on its own and a two-point function for the other two scalars on their own. So it's it's like the, the disconnected contribution to this four-point function. So we'll pull that out. It's always there for these identical scalars. So I'm going to get a factor of v to the eta still and a one, that's the identity, plus this slightly altered sum, put a prime to show that I've taken out the identity, c delta i squared. Those are those three-point function coefficients, g delta i of u and v, and this had better be equal to u to the eta, one, and then the similar sum on the other side, again with the identity removed, g delta i, and now with u and v switched. Great. Now one last step. I'm almost done here. Uh, let's move the identity, identity to one side. So I can just have a single sum just over the delta i's. And so I'm going to write this whole thing as 1 is equal to this altered sum, which doesn't have the identity, c delta i squared v to the eta g delta i u v minus u to the eta g delta i v u divided by u to the eta minus v to the eta. So I, I see my picture has partially obscured the uh, ending parentheses there, but I think that's clear enough. All right, so this is the form I'm going to work with it uh, for the conformal bootstrap in the last lecture this week. But let's just pause and, and stare at this. Uh, we'll, we'll write it again on the next page and, and, and think about what it means. So the first comment, the first comment is that a generic selection of primary operators and three-point functions, c delta i, will fail to satisfy this relation. 
there's no way if I just you know pick my favorite conformal primaries and my favorite three-point functions and just tell tell them all to you straight away that you, and you plug it into this expression for which the g delta i's are all fixed that you'll get one out of this. It's just not possible. So your generic uh, CFT defined in this way will fail to be a CFT. Well, maybe we should be le less ambitious. Let's try to be less ambitious. Maybe we can just pick the primaries. Can we just pick the spectrum of the C CFT? And then maybe having picked the spectrum, we can adjust the three-point function so that this, this expression and all the similar expressions for all the other uh, four-point functions are true. And it turns out that even this is too much to ask. Even this is too much to ask for unitary theories. In unitary theories, there are further constraints on the deltas and these three-point functions. For example, in unitary theories, it's gonna be true that the C delta I squareds are greater than zero. And because of that, because of that, we can use this crossing symmetry constraint as a tool to constrain the space of possible conformal field theories. And I put an exclamation mark there, just like they put an exclamation mark after really good chess moves, uh, because it's a very interesting observation that's been used in a lot of current research, and also research that goes back uh, 20 or 30 years or so. And this all goes by the name of the bootstrap using this crossing symmetry constraint to uh, investigate the space of conformal field theories, uh, this is the conformal bootstrap. I've said almost all I want to say to, in this little mini lecture. I have one more uh, remark to make and then we'll bring things to a close. Are there further crossing symmetry constraints for higher point functions? Now what's a little bit interesting about this four point function crossing symmetry constraint or, or what's further further interesting about it is it turns out uh, that crossing symmetry for the four-point function is enough to guarantee that the higher point functions are well behaved as well. If you have crossing symmetry for the four-point functions, you can guarantee that the higher point functions will also be crossing symmetry symmetric in the same way. Let me just write a picture. I think it's maybe easiest to see if I, if I draw a, again one of those Feynman diagrams so you can see, what, see what's meant. So let's have let's look at a five-point function where I'm again going to analyze it uh, by think by bringing points close together and trying to generate the, these operator product expansions uh, for each uh, pairwise set of points I bring together. So here here are my insertions one two three four and five and I'll get sums over these intermediate channels of conformal primaries of dimension delta representation i or dimension delta prime representation i prime. So in this case, you know, I brought one and two close together. I brought four and five close together. And then I've also brought this, uh, this, third, this third guy. Well, I have kind of an option whether to think about bringing it close together to uh, these operators in that internal channel, or I could also maybe bring it close on that side and then join it up with the, the others. It's really up to you. That's what these sort of, uh, these crossing symmetry constraints uh, do, where you, you sort of pairwise bring all these different operators close together. Okay, now the point is that crossing symmetry for four-point functions is enough to guarantee crossing symmetry for higher point functions. And we'll just represent that pictorially in the following way. So we could, for example, consider bringing two and three close together instead of one and two close together. We get a different intermediate channel. And then here's, here's one, and then we have another intermediate channel, delta prime i prime, and this branches off to give four and five. So the point uh, of this picture is just, just to show you that you, you have in each case sort of a four-point function subdiagram in here where you're applying uh, the crossing symmetry constraint. And so this crossing symmetry for the four-point subdiagram is enough to guarantee crossing symmetry for the whole uh, endpoint function as a whole, in this case, the five-point function. So let's just say it in words. We can access all possible ways of decomposing higher point functions from the crossing symmetry constraint on the four point function. And the last thing I'd like to say is, is maybe a, 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 a more formal statement about what this means mathematically. This is a statement about associativity of the operator algebra. Associativity of the operator algebra. So if I have a product of three, al three operators, I can take A times B, C, where I multiply B, B and C together first, or I can multiply also A and B together first, and then multiply it by C. Or in this language, I can bring B and C close together, and then bring those close together to A, or I can bring A and B close together, and then bring those close together to C. This is the idea of crossing symmetry. It's a statement about associativity of these conformal primaries and their uh, operator product expansions. All right. That's all I wanted to say for the first mini lecture. So my plan for the next couple lectures, the next lecture, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a little break 
and talk to you about what unitarity is in the context of conformal field theory. It's also a statement about what's called reflection positivity. In the case of a Euclidean theory, these are really the same thing. And then having established what unitarity means for conformal field theory, we'll go on in the third mini lecture and talk about the uh, conformal bootstrap and some results that have come out of it. Okay, great.